on the train. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Any more? You just shut them out. That work was so Compassion. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like you just shot a three point iron. Yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so, the whole book. Hmm. The whole book talks about six states of mind that you should desperately work to develop. Yeah? The last state of mind in the book is wisdom. They're not in the book, in practice. It's wisdom, the thing we just covered. And he finished it with understanding emptiness, which is wisdom, that things don't have a nature from their own side. Yeah? Which means emptiness. will free you. But that you need to use to generate the biggest energy you can to generate a world that is free from suffering. Therefore, love and compassion. You got that? Yeah. And these are the six states of mind that he covered. The book is giving ethics, oh sorry, the ethics, patience, which means not getting angry, joy, goodness, happiness about doing good things. Concentration or meditation, developing these things and wisdom. Yeah? But he hasn't covered giving yet. These are the six perfections giving or generosity. But developing that state of mind as a habit will generate. So, what, what's the. If cause and effect is true for even mental things, what's the result of giving, 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 giving? Everybody gets everything they want. What must you experience? You must experience getting everything you want from everyone, not just one person. Awesome. So, the, the next one is ethics. He covered that, right? Not because baby Jesus said it's good. You must be good. Not because of that. Because things are empty. If things don't have a nature on their, from their own side, then they can be anything you project. So what you're loading up by being ethical, which means, at the bare minimum, protecting life, taking care of life. What would the result be? Your life being taken care of, or abundant life, or healthy body, or your life is good. Your life force. Your ethics. Not lying, not cheating. Meaning, you hear truth. You won't be taken advantage of. You, I mean, you see why ethics works? Because of karma. Not because someone said, and I think that's been the greatest mistake of my experience of Western <coughs> religious views. They're missing the wisdom component. I haven't come across a wisdom component that explained to me early on why I should be good. Now I understand. It's like enlightened self-interest, his holiness says. If emptiness is true, then ethics must produce a positive experience. Therefore, ethics is it. So that's the second state of mind. Generosity, giving, ethics. Then, patience, which in this system means not getting angry, not generating anger when you're supposed to. When you get punched in the face, but I'm angry. Nothing generates anger. Patience, that's why I call it patience. Yeah? Imagine a peaceful state of mind. You're developing a peaceful state of mind over and over and over. What will that generate? A peaceful state of mind. Yeah. And then concentration. Concentration is fundamental, the practice of meditation. Because without concentration, you can't catch karma and emptiness in your mind projecting. It's happening so fast, you miss it. Concentration lets you habituate that understanding in meditative state, and then you use that in your day-to-day -day experience. What you saw on the cushion, you use that every day, and you maintain that concentration because you know how reality isn't. It's not the way it's appearing. Concentration helps you get that. It has all these other side benefits. You can focus better at work, rather than boring. You can <laughs> save your life. 
because you remember how reality functions. And then wisdom, which you should color all those things with because understanding the truth will create a truth. You'll be operating with the right courses, not with mistaken courses. Yeah? Who saw, what's the movie? Sunshine, Eternal Mind, I think. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Is that the one? No, it's the one that, where the guy ends, there's this kid that thinks. Little Miss Sunshine? Is that Little Miss Sunshine? Not sure. The kid being in the movie, I think he's got the poop back and forth. What's that movie? Forever? You, me, oh. and everyone. You, me, and everyone we know? Something yeah. like that. Yeah? That's the, one. That's the one. The kid in that movie, beautiful stunning kid, thinks right throughout the movie that the sun rises in the sky when he hears metal tapping. Do you remember that? Like he hears this. The quarter on the. And oh. every morning the sun comes up, and at the end of the movie, it's revealed that there's an old man waiting for the bus every morning, and he's sitting there with a quarter just banging on the thing sign because he's impatient, waiting, waiting, waiting for the bus, you know? So with his quarter, he makes that noise. But the kid's experience is that every time he hears that quarter from his bedroom, he looks out the window, the sun comes up. So he thinks the sun comes up because of that sound. I love yeah. that you remembered the poop thing, though. I, I know. Like, <laughs> he created that emoji. Yeah, he created that emoji with the two things. Um, see, our understanding of the world is like that. We think the quarter makes the sun come up. Reality is different. Concentration lets you understand how reality functions. And that can let you give you enough space to generate a true cause, a perfect cause. But he hasn't covered giving yet. And this is how stunningly clever Master Shantideva is. Why do you think he would have waited for the last chapter to cover the first state of mind, giving? Any thoughts? Why would he wait till the end to talk about giving? In order to maybe get people on the right mindset first. Because That's cool. So, so, so people will be motivated for it by the time they get there. Good. Good. Is it maybe that at the end, if you want to have all these be a reality in your world, you have to give them away to the people? Stunning. Better. Yeah. He actually has something to give now. He finished a book about transforming your world to an enlightened world. You create your paradise. You don't have to suffer. Life does not have to be a series of disappointments. It's empty. You can transform it. That teaching, that wisdom, he can now give it away. He finished it. He's like, I made a book with this stuff. I've got something so precious to give. The karma of giving that away is like, blow your mind. Do you see it? It's not like, let me tell you about giving. He doesn't have anything to give at the beginning. So he put it at the end, and he put it at the end in, in the form of dedication. You know when we do when we do the preliminary practices at the beginning of meditation, we don't do them because it's just someone thought it'd be a great idea. We do them because it's a shortcut to bodhicitta. We do the seven limb practice which you call in an enlightened being, you think of their highest quality, you take refuge, you make them offerings, you give them something, yeah? you do this confessional, the four powers, try and remove any obstacles from your mind, you do the rejoicical, generate some goodness, it's, it's part of the thing that says, <laughs> remove negative, what, well, rejoicical? Yeah. Um, <coughs> then you ask, you do your stuff, and then you ask for the guidance, you ask them to stay, and at the end, you dedicate the entire practice of meditation. He's doing it in exactly that way. He's using this method, and the commentary says that's why he's doing it. This is the way he taught the beginning of the Bodhisattva Charabhata. When you do this day after day after day, it's like you're reciting the entire Bodhisattva Charabhata in your meditation cushion. Condensed. Everything you've studied. Seven limbs. Imagine your Lama. Oh, what's awesome about them? Take refuge, karma, emptiness. Give them something. Oh, I'm giving a perfect being something. That's causing a karma in, a karma in your mind. I'm giving, good karma, right? A perfect being, free from samsara, 
all of a sudden the karma of free from samsara is entering your mind. You're giving to that. You're connecting to that world. Things are empty. There ain't no being needing cookies from you. They don't need cookies, okay? It's all a thing that you're doing to generate a state. So he's saying, right at the end, I'm giving this awesome mechanism for getting to enlightenment, the six perfections, I'm giving it away. And here's the important difference, and maybe it will answer your question about different feelings and states. The difference between dedication, Noah, and uh, Munlam, which is a prayer, the one we do at the beginning. The beginning is a beautiful thing. A Munlam is a beautiful, an aspiration. May I reach? Could I please? Yeah? But dedication has substance. You actually got material stuff, a karma with content. I just wrote a book called the Bodhisattva Charavatara. I'm giving that away. Yeah? Your mind believes that's more powerful than a moonlight because you've got a something. Do you see it? Difference between prayer and dedication? It's almost like the before and after. Exactly. You're like, oh, may I, may I, may I. Oh, I just produce it. I'm giving it away. Right? And to answer also part of, no, your question, yeah, how can I? <laughs> but a prayer can also be not just for you, but for some, for... Like, it can be for all sorts of things. Yeah, like you can still give a prayer away, but it's like you, ha you don't have it yet. If you're dedicating, you're saying, may this goodness that I just did serve for a particular purpose. Yeah. Yeah, and the most awesome particular purpose could be, may I get enlightened for the sake of every living being. May I really wake up to what I think I'm hearing. May that happen. So all this activity I just did, you grab it and you give it away. Why? I think I've got it here. Because here's the positive and the negative about dedication. When you give away a virtue, when, when you witness yourself, giving something away, you're planting a karma in your mind. Your mind observed you giving something away. That's an imprint, an imprint in your mind, which must have a result, yeah? Mm. If you're giving it to an ultimate thing, for full enlightenment, for the sake of every living being, all of a sudden, you have began to color that karma that could otherwise just be a black and white result, just a normal goodness. If it was a virtue, it must produce a positive result. If it's just in samsara, if you're just like, oh, I just did a good thing, yay, that's going to come up as a really good thing at some point and then disappear. Because that's what things do in samsara. Giving it away to a state that is perfected out of samsara, enlightenment, makes that karma, or can make that karma if you have that conception, out of the circle of samsara and producing enlightenment. It has the capacity to get, it's like putting it in the bank. I'm saving this thing and it's growing in my bank account that I get when I have the karma to experience myself out of samsara. It's like a very visual practice, right? Well, visceral practice, I want to say, because for example, you didn't write the Bodhisattva Charavatara. Master Shantideva wrote that, right? And he gave it away. But I think what you did is harder. You're not Master Shantideva. I'm not Master Shantideva. We don't speak Sanskrit or Pali at the time. We don't have a culture that believes in these things. We're so far removed from that thing that it's deeply difficult for us to get in contact with what he's trying to say. And you're struggling, you're in there. You spent all your time and energy studying these things to the best of your ability, trying to get them, challenging your worldview. That's an infinitely good virtue. That's harder than writing a book in a state of mind where everybody believes that stuff. He's just refuting fine points. So you can give away not a written book, but your mental conceptions of having studied and understood and internalized this thing. You can sit here and go, however many classes I came to, how much struggle I've ever gone to to try and fit this into my understanding. However, however many moments of goodness you've had in your mind, in 
your heart about using this stuff to free yourself from samsara and every sentient being the suffering. You're thinking, may this help me? May every one of those moments, you can imagine in your heart collecting them as a condensed thing right now and dedicating it. May, may that ripen at some future time as my enlightenment, as my seeing emptiness directly. Whatever it is that will give you that permanent outside of samsara spiraling up experience. In fact, that's how Buddhists maintain a Buddha realm. It's fusion for good karma. They figured a way to give away faster than what they get. Make more, it's fusion, right? You get more energy out than energy came in. So they figured a way that as soon as I get something, you give it away rapidly with emptiness in your mind, with wisdom in your mind, all sentient beings in your mind, just expanded the hell out of that interaction and you've just created a spiraling up effect. Enough of that gives you a perception that you're in a paradisical realm, which is a reality for those beings, as much as this is a reality for you. This ain't truth, it's empty. You're just having an experience forced upon, forced on you by your past karma. So are they. Which one's real? Yes. <laughs> Which one's empty? Yes. Which one do you want? <laughs> you know? Not Donald Trump. So if you don't dedicate them, if you don't, if you don't give them away, they just become good short-term things. Every goodness you do must give you a goodness. Every negativity, every jealousy, anger, hatred must give you the same. Sorry. We see if we, if we push this to the limit, we don't like it. Let me give you an example. We want innocent victims, right? In our worldview, victims for us are innocent. This worldview says, uh, "Sorry, you got what you got," because it's you're part of the experience. That should give you more compassion. See it? So, good karmas give you good results. Not dedicated give you short-term expirable results. Result. Dedicated, infused with wisdom and bodhicitta towards every living being gives you an expanding good result which ultimately leads to nirvana or guru. Sparrow. <laughs> Two things. When I first moved to New York, I think I've told this story, I found a beautiful mala like this. I've never seen one before. On Fifth Avenue and 18th Street. Like that. On the pavement. Mm -hmm. It was stunning. It was made out of, um, what do you call that white stuff? That elephant tusk Ivory. things? Ivory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was incredible. I'm like, wow. And it was ancient. It was old. It was like bizarre. It was around the same month that I met my holy teacher, Geshe Michael Roach. When I got up first, Shakti thing, where I went, oh, I heard what he'd been saying all along. For the first time, this was the most important thing in my spiritual reluctant experience. So I gave it to him. Within a day, it was with somebody else. I'm like, bastard! <laughs> but not bastard. Right? It, it's something, you've got to give away what you get. Quickly, like give it away. That's how you generate more of the same. You want more of these? Give them more. It solves it. To our normal way of thinking, but who's? I mean, normal. Yeah, adjective normal. You don't want normal. The world's going to try and tell you, Jacqueline, you're normal. Sorry, this is normal. Yeah, suffering's normal. It ain't normal. It doesn't have to be that way. It's possible. Completely. And it's not like some dreamy thing. It's practical, like logically. How can you prove it? Sometimes you're not normal. Sometimes you have experiences that are transcendental. Then they disappear. They're available. You can make them. They're producible. You did it. You did not. I don't remember. Right. Understand the logic. Do it. <coughs> Practice. Try something. 
see if you can generate some more. Then give it away. Give it away. Give it away. Sparrow. So that's one story. Wait, why Sparrow? I don't know. I'm doing that. Oh. Every deed dedicated, every virtue, every positive deed dedicated to an ultimate state must produce a result similar to that virtue in that state, right? So you could be, and I've done this with Dharma buddies, you sit in the park with a little loaf of bread and you give it away to sparrows. But then you imagine, I'm hooking you to studying the Bodhisattva Charavatara with me, maybe in three lifetimes from now. We're going to meet one day and I'm going to give you all the wisdom I have. And you'll watch that little critter eat away that thing. And the next one. And the next one. Every act of goodness that you have in your world, you can dedicate to your ultimate enlightenment for the sake of every living being. Play with it. Nothing is wasted here. Sitting on the subway, feeling a kind of relaxation and comfort instantly. Imagine the beauty if everybody got this thing. Having an orgasm. Give it away quickly before you get tired. Like, give it away and you want to fall asleep. Give it away. Everything. The best tasting food. Imagine that same sensation. Give it away to every perfect being that needs it. Stop it, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> the sparrow. You have to be, you have to make it your own. Everything, a tiny movement. If you get really subtle and really good with meditation, you could just be sitting there one day and then, you know, like just stretching your back a little gives you this bliss. Give it away. Everybody with back problems, go on now. Every virtue, every virtue dedicated to a time when you and them will meet each other in some paradisical realm. It's not weird imaginary stuff. It seeds in your mind. And what if it was just an idea? It's a much better way of living than the other stuff. You know, but not the, it isn't, right? So, okay, we're, I, we're not covering the 10th chapter because it's this long, right? And it's covered in the most beautiful things. He goes to all the realms of existence and he says, because things are empty, may I become the cooling drops of rain that land upon the beings of the hottest elves and give some respite. May I be the warmth in the heart of beings that are lost in frozen lands. May I be the bridge that people... Like, it's just this immense giving and giving. He wants to be everything to everyone. It's stunning. But I can't... We don't have time to do it all. So he does two final dedications. In the dedication chapter, he does two, two beautiful things. At the very, very end, we're now at the last two paragraphs of the entire book. The perfection of giving, after covering wisdom and all the others. And what does he choose first? He chooses to say, this dharma, this idea, this worldview, it, can, it is the only medicine that can change the world. Every other worldview, remember I talked about it, was incomplete and dysfunctional. Understanding karma and emptiness is complete and functional. Complete because it covers everything. There's nothing left out. In our scientific worldview, we can't explain why my mum died, or my dad died, or this or that. We can say the brain hurt, this and that, but we don't know why my dad, why in this case, and the guy next to him didn't. We don't answer those questions. It's incomplete. That's what we really want to know. We don't give a shit if it was the left brain Blah. Why did my dad die? Right? We really want to know those things. So a view that explains that, karma and emptiness, is complete and functional. Because it works to deliver happiness. All the other things that we think are going to deliver that happiness, all the reasons you go to work in the morning, all the reasons you get dressed to go to work, all the bullshit study we do in universities to try and get the career, to get the house, to get the are all because you want to get happy and they don't give you that. If they did, everybody would be that career. They don't give it to you, really. Everybody on the planet, from Africa to the United States, it doesn't matter, throughout time, with all the other worldviews, have found that 
incomplete and dysfunctional way of being. We don't get the happiness we're looking for. Master Shantideva says, this view does. So he says, oh wow, I've found a view that can result in a complete and functional reality. Now I'm going to work it. It's not like, oh, I've thought of it, it's happened. Now I'm going to work it. So he says, may that view stay. May that view stay in the world. I think I'll read the thing he says. I think if I find it. And he says, the teaching of the enlightened ones are the one medicine that can cure the great sickness of all living kind. They are the one ultimate source of every form of happiness. And so by this power, may the teachings remain long upon this planet with all the support they require and all the respect they deserve. He's saying, if you're hearing this song of meaning, you've got to keep it going. You've got to let it stay. Because otherwise, you listening to a possible solution, I understand it's not the solution unless you experience it as that, but you've heard a possible solution to all the world's problems. If karma and emptiness are true, that's a dependent arising thing. That will expire unless you keep it going. Do you, do you follow my meaning? Do you follow what I'm saying? And what do you think the final, final lines are? So he said, wow, this whole thing, may it stay here so every living being can be free. Real compassion, right? What's the very, very, very last line, do you think? Give it away. He just gave it away. He gave away everything. <laughs> he says, my heart teacher, my only connection to understanding these things is my teacher. For him, his teacher was Manjushri. Yeah? So he says, I'll read you what he says. Uh, and lastly, do I bow myself down to the one called Gentle Voice, yeah, Mantushri, the one who has been kind enough to teach me the ways of virtue. Thus, last, do I bow myself down to the one who was kind enough to raise me up from childhood about to you, my spiritual friend, who he projected, but who functions. Mantushri is empty of having that from his own side. He created a Manjushri. He wants to keep it going. So for us, has been this unlikely crowd. Yeah? In the meaning in this room came from 10,253 pages translated from Sanskrit and Tibetan by Geshe Michael Roach. I don't care what other people if he didn't do 10,253 pages of a language I could never understand into a language I could understand and then transmitted that in a way I could internalize it, I couldn't A, internalize it and B, share it with you. What gratitude can you give to someone like that? Like, that's my functioning reality, our functioning reality, you're connected to these dudes, Ken Rinpoche, who escaped from Tibet when Sarah May Monastery was being bombed. He grabbed a bunch of texts and tankas and ran out. He realized he was in his towel because he was shaving. He went back in, got some robes, and then ran back out again. If it wasn't for him and his trek over the Himalayas and working in Dharamsala and then being asked to run a monastery here in Howell, New Jersey, that weirdness is in this room. And then Trijan Rinpoche and Pabonka Rinpoche and Jet Songkhapa all the way back to the room. There's a real chain of events that happened for us to be in this room. And that didn't happen separate from your karma. This particular shape of your experience of wisdom came from you too in relation to these beings. We're intricately connected. So, if you don't find a heart teacher, and I'm just sharing information here. I don't consider myself your teacher. I'm giving information to you. You have to find a spiritual friend, like Master Shantideva found, that is 
alive and connected with you, turning these things on for you, and vice versa. It's a tricky relationship. They'll challenge you. They'll press you. They'll push you out of your normal. That's their job. And your job is to engage with them, understanding that they don't have that nature. You're creating your reality, including the one connection you have to all this wisdom. There is one being connecting with you, giving you this information. And for me, they're all like tantric deities, magical deities. If that's possible, then there's been plenty of beings who have created that experience for themselves, and they're all around you, just trying to reach out. Rachel. Rachel, wake up. No, not that. Rachel, Rachel, wake up. <laughs> and every now and then you'll listen. You're like, whoa. And they'll appear as this dude or that lady or that idea or something. It's all dependently arising. It comes from your virtue. Things don't have a nature. So I think it's appropriate. You should close off this. It's been a year on this book. And every moment of your mind that was turned on to a positive, a good idea, a gift, dedicated, like spend some time there, we'll do like a five minute thinking deeply about every being that you're <coughs> able to conceive of having a wisdom arising them, a connection to a heart teacher, may come to them, whatever shape or color that looks like. Like I said before, Buddhism doesn't own enlightenment. It's just a vehicle, it's a world view. My view it happens to be complete, it's not lacking the wisdom part or whatever. So think about the people in your life who you wish to wake up. Think about your perfect being. You're not normal. I know some of you are definitely not normal. Um, and, then, <laughs> and then it's a nice close to a beautiful thing. And, and for me, the opportunity to share, for you guys to keep coming to this center, to the Three Jewels, for us to have this dialogue, can you imagine the magnificent virtue it is for me to speak open and honestly about stuff you can't talk in the workplace? Because, I mean, you don't talk about this, you have to make more designs or whatever you do in the workplace. Yeah? Life is short, people. There's very few moments you can get true, deep meaning that covers all of existence. Today is one of them. This whole course has been one of them. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share. And I'm grateful that you keep coming. And I hope every being you touch gets touched by wisdom to whatever point you understood it. So let's do some nice dedication. Uh, So just take a minute, or five minutes, just to sit down and imagine giving away any virtue for the sake of your pure enlightenment, for the sake of everything. Think specifically of the faces you know and then some unknown faces until you cover the whole planet and time.
finally ask if there are enlightened beings and they can see all things. Ask for their blessings, meaning may you have the karma to see your mind turned on being blessed and understanding something. May you experience them reaching out to you. Ask for their blessings so you can internalize them, live a way of life that can free you from the temporal nature of this planet and this existence. For the sake of helping others achieve that same state. Imagine what it would feel like to have your mind blessed that way, how it would conceive of reality, how we would understand these concepts. When you're ready, you can open your eyes. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you for teaching. Thank you. Thank Please you. keep Thank teaching. You. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for being the mutual architect of beauty.